tonight, why some hospitals are asking patients to think twice before showing up. Most patients that are waiting a long period of time usually don't even need to be in the emergency department. Long waits, packed ERs, and a surge of respiratory illness prompt an urgent appeal from doctors. Blunt words from Israel's most decorated soldier and former prime minister on the war and the path forward. How much pressure is there for him to go? The main responsible for this unprecedented blunder in our history is Netanyahu. And from the Jeffersons to Archie Bunker, remembering Norman Lear, the man who changed television forever. My hope for the future of television is that it will take itself as seriously as it is taken. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with a dire message from beleaguered Canadian hospitals. They are understaffed and overwhelmed as respiratory infections surge. COVID, flu, and RSV cases are rising. Wait times in some ERs are now hours long, prompting some hospitals to urge people in no uncertain terms, unless you or your children are extremely sick, do not come in. As Lauren Pelly tells us now, in Montreal, the ER crisis is so serious, health officials are warning of a perfect storm. At Montreal Children's Hospital, the emergency department was running at more than 150% occupancy for most of November. It's like uh, six hours wait. We do have a lot of sick children. Hospital officials are ringing alarms, saying a staffing crunch, a lack of family doctors, and a busy respiratory virus season are creating a perfect storm. Most patients that are waiting a long period of time usually don't even need to be in the emergency department. If they're waiting very long, usually it's because they should have gone to see a clinic. This quiet crisis is playing out at hospitals across the country. Wait times at multiple emergency departments in Alberta and Ontario are also hours long. This Toronto emergency physician says for minor issues, try to go to a family doctor. But if you have chest pain or you have abdominal pain or you're concerned that you're having a stroke or shortness of breath or something that really requires emergency care, these people should come in. The challenge, she says, is that hospitals are facing the pressure of seasonal illnesses plus COVID-19. So it's just making a situation that was already always bad in the fall even worse. Federal data shows flu activity is up, respiratory syncytial virus activity is too, and daily COVID hospitalizations keep rising as well, hitting 4,600 by late November. Add to all of that, health officials in multiple countries warn bacterial infections such as mycoplasma are also making a comeback, causing a resurgence of walking pneumonia. Typically less severe than regular pneumonia, but it can turn serious. The Public Health Agency of Canada told CBC News that labs are already looking out for it. This is sort of going to be the new norm going forward, that we're going to have this level of infection. So, Lauren, I get that the message to Canadians is don't come to the emergency room unless it's absolutely necessary. But, but it is not always quite that simple. Well, you're right. I mean, the advice is if you can go to a family doctor or a nurse practitioner or your pharmacist. But there are millions of Canadians without access to a primary care provider. So this might be a bit of a tough pill to swallow. We sort of have two health crises that are compounding on each other right now and making the situation in hospitals even worse. And we have a long winter ahead. All right. Let's be careful then. Lauren Pelly, thank you. Thank you. Ontario's Auditor General is putting a number on the problem. He says one in five patients who visited emergency rooms in the province were only there because they did not have a family doctor. He's also calling on the province to come up with a plan to help with chronic understaffing. A province-wide strategy to help hospitals and long-term care homes maintain appropriate staffing levels is critical for the sector's success moving forward. His report, released today, highlights a significant jump in the use of nurses from staffing agencies in northern hospitals at three times the cost. In Las Vegas, police say three people were killed and a fourth injured after a shooter opened fire on a university campus. The suspect was then killed in a confrontation with police. What happened today is a heinous, unforgivable crime. But I want you all to know something. It's a crime that we train for each and every day. 
Police poured onto the University of Nevada campus just before noon when gunshots rang out and students scrambled to safety. Police say they know the shooter's identity but won't release it until next of kin are notified. They have also not commented yet on a motive. Turning to the war in the Middle East, Israel now says it will allow more fuel into Gaza, a minimal increase, it says, to prevent a humanitarian collapse as fighting pushes more people further south. Israeli forces are now battling Hamas in the heart of Han Yunus, an area previously deemed safe for civilians. So that means more are now living like this, sheltering in tents after fleeing their homes. Paul Hunter has the latest on the offensive and the push for a ceasefire. In this hospital in Khan Yunus in southern Gaza, chaos, misery, despair, and angry frustration. The Israelis told us to go to the south because it is safe, said this man. So we did, but there is no safe place in Gaza. <laughs> this 11-year-old, her life upended, sobbing. Her father on that stretcher, her family, she says, hit by an Israeli strike. They hit us twice. It landed on us and on my father. Indeed, the Israeli offensive continues in southern Gaza, part of Israel's response to the brutal attacks by Hamas October 7th. It's an area now jammed with hundreds of thousands who fled northern Gaza seeking safety in October and November. So many Gazans have been killed. There is now little room for individual burials. Mass graves have become the norm. Given the scale of the loss of human life in at the United Gaza, Nations Israel, today, word a, a rarely short. used mechanism has been applied, what's known as UN Article 99, which puts pressure on the UN Security Council to demand a ceasefire. Article 99 states, and I quote, that the Secretary General may bring to the attention of the Security Council any matter in his opinion that may threaten the maintenance of international peace and security. All of this, as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced, Israeli forces have surrounded the Khan Yunis home of a top Hamas leader believed to have been integral to the October 7th attacks. On a day, Hamas rockets were fired yet again toward targets in Israel. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now to the war in Ukraine. Kiev is getting more aid from the United States, one of the last packages Washington says it can provide. And as Chris Brown shows us, it comes amid a struggle to get supplies before winter and an increasingly confident-looking Vladimir Putin. Ukraine is enduring some of its most uncertain months since Russia's invasion. Along with the billions in future American military aid stalled in the U.S. Congress, other goods are now blocked at its border by Polish truckers in a dispute over permits and paperwork. Ukrainian truck driver Roman Kalidin turned his cab into his home as he waited an astounding 16 days to cross the border. The Russians are obviously enemies, but this is meanness from a friend, he said. The Polish truckers want a pre-war system of entry permits for Ukrainian trucks restored so they won't flood the market. In Kyiv, residents admit they're worried about being abandoned by their allies. I'm scared if Ukraine is left without help, the war will drag on longer, she said. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky was in the streets of the capital today, attempting to sound reassuring about all of the problems. It's not easy now, but we're moving along, he said. Vladimir Putin, meanwhile, has seldom appeared as confident, making a rare trip abroad to the Middle East. Putin has mobilized Russia's economy to support his war in countries such as the UAE and Saudi Arabia, where he also visited, have played a key role, says this expert. The global south is acquiring great and great importance in terms of sanctions evasions and uh, evasion for Russia and uh, easing the pressure of uh, sanctions on the Russian economy. Putin's armies may be bogged down in Ukrainian battlefields, absorbing immense losses. But these brief trips are a reminder that though a pariah in the West, Russia's leader is far from isolated.
Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Back here in Canada, Assembly of First Nations leaders are gathered in Ottawa to choose a new national chief. From six candidates, just two remain after multiple rounds of voting. David Pratt of Muscopeting First Nation in Saskatchewan and Cindy Woodhouse of Penemutang First Nation in Manitoba. Olivia Stefanovic has been tracking the vote for us. And Olivia, it certainly looks like this will not be settled tonight. That's right, Adrian. There's been multiple rounds of ballots and still no winner who's received the 60% of votes required to become the next national chief. Now, there's tension between the two remaining candidates. Cindy Woodhouse, the AFN's Manitoba Regional Chief, and David Pratt, the first vice chief of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations from Saskatchewan. Woodhouse asked Pratt to concede because she's leading in the ballots in terms of support, but Pratt is staying in the race, so voting is continuing into Thursday, Adrian, and there are big expectations with people who make up the assembly for the next national chief. We had a very nice uh, turnout. A vote to choose a new leader and a new direction for the assembly of First Nations. We need a national chief who can convene people and bring people together to find a way to collaborate and with uh, the different viewpoints and to create an action plan that can then be implemented. But reuniting the AFN could prove tough after the ouster of former national chief Roseanne Archibald over misconduct allegations and a separate report that found widespread harassment and sexual misconduct throughout the organization. I'm looking for stability and some respect uh, brought back to the AFN. These First Nations people are looking for a new leader who will stand up for their interests. The AFN has a huge role to help advocate for First Nations and mm -hmm. they haven't been able to do that. They've been so distra distracted. This elder wants someone to act on the pressing issues facing First Nations across the country. I'd like to see them deal with the opioid crisis and the, the homelessness. Others simply want fearless leadership. I would like to see someone that's uh, clearly loud and, and, and uh, standing with us and not afraid to, you know, make some noise. Now, once a winner is finally chosen, Olivia, what are you watching for next? Well, Adrian, there will be an oath of office ceremony, and then it's straight to work for the next national chief, healing fractures within the organization, working with Ottawa to advance rights amid economic uncertainty and possibly a change in government. All right, Olivia Stefanovic in Ottawa will be watching. Thank you. Now, the Bank of Canada is holding its benchmark interest rate steady at 5%. The move was widely expected now that inflation is easing. Economists are now predicting the bank will begin cutting rates in the second half of 2024. Many farmers were hoping for a cut to their high costs with a proposed suspension of the carbon tax, but the legislation that could have made that possible now has a slim chance of passing. Kate McKenna now with a political fight and those caught in the middle. Before they're loaded into trucks like this, some grains need to be dried. And farmers say the carbon tax on the fuel that heats this silo is driving up the cost of food. Generally, when you know, when I talk to uh, talk to other farmers, they do the same thing that I do. Basically, you can't sell your product for what you used to be able to sell it for. He says he pays up to $25,000 a year in carbon tax, and he hoped a Conservative private member's bill would pass and give him a break. It would remove the carbon tax on the fuel used to dry grain and exempt it on fuel for heating barns and greenhouses. But it's hit a snag. The Honourable Senator Busson. The Senate voted to amend the bill, delaying it from passing and putting its future in jeopardy. I've already heard from dozens of farmers already sharing deep disappointment. This bill found itself in the spotlight and senators under pressure. It was a target for conservatives who've made abolishing the carbon tax their signature policy. We are announcing a three-year pause. After the Liberals suspended the tax on home heating oil, the Prime Minister vowed no more exemptions. There will absolutely not be any other carve-outs or suspensions of the price on pollution. That pledge created pressure on the government to kill the bill. So there clearly has been some politicking in the Senate, clearly has been some lobbying. It's unfortunate to see. Now that politicking has intensified. Well, I've got news for Justin Trudeau. You've ruined Christmas for Canadians. Common sense conservatives 
are going to ruin your vacation as well. Pierre Polyev says his party will use every tool to force Parliament to sit through the holidays unless more carbon tax exemptions are made. He can, you know, make us work late. We're happy to do it. The Conservatives plan to force a 24-hour voting marathon in the House of Commons starting Thursday. They say it's just the beginning of what will be a procedural brawl. One thing is clear, the political fight over carbon pricing is far from over. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. CBC News has learned the federal government will announce a cap-and-trade system tomorrow to limit emissions from oil and gas productions. Senior government sources tell CBC News the plan will allow companies to buy and trade permits to emit carbon, and those permits could decline over time to cap emissions. The actual draft regulations aren't expected until the middle of next year. Well, Hollywood is mourning a legendary producer and screenwriter tonight. Norman Lear was a progressive pioneer behind a string of hit shows that put everyday Americans on center stage. Aaron Collins shows us how he revolutionized television. Eat it, uh, hey, eat it. <laughs> At its best, television reflects its audience back to it, airing difficult conversations going on around dinner tables. When the hell are you going to admit that the war was wrong? I ain't talking about that war. I don't want to talk about that goddamn war no more. Over a career that spanned decades, Norman Lear did just that. From war to America's lingering struggles with race, the legendary producer put it all on TV. Lionel! Martin Luther King helped accomplish a lot for our people. Oh, sure he tried, but what did he really accomplish? I mean, nothing's changed. Born in Connecticut before working in TV, Lear was a gunner on a bomber in the Second World War. Oh, you what? By 1971, he'd found his calling, producing All in the Family for CBS. The show revolved around a working-class family in New York. Edgy for its time, it took on contentious issues from homosexuality to abortion. That approach, a product of Lear's own upbringing. Well, I lived in a house that, where everybody didn't get along and everybody uh, had their own problems. Uh, across from neighbors, down the street from neighbors, up the street from other neighbors, uh, had problems that we were dealing with. We are the Jeffersons. Lear produced a spin-off to All in the Family focused on a prosperous black family. Over its 10-year run, the Jeffersons put America's racial divide in the spotlight. Good God, you're black. Over the next decade, Lear produced a string of hit TV shows from Good Times. Happy, bright, narrow man in. Pure dine, oh my! To one day at a time. Changing the face of American television along the way. Norman Lear has held up a mirror to American society and changed the way we look at it. While his work shifted the way Americans saw themselves, Lear hoped it would change television too. My hope for the future of television is that it will take itself as seriously as it is taken. Norman Lear was 101 years old. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. One of the world's best baseball players could be heading to Toronto. And the one two. High drive, center field. The race to nab Shohei Otani. Please come to Toronto. They'll be great. And what it would mean for the future of the Blue Jays. Plus. An artificial intelligence tool that's causing real controversy. Wow. My plays, some of my nonfiction, and my novels. How Canadian authors are being impacted. And the stunning moment an orange tabby decided to rescue himself. Oh, my. Oh, here, check out my cat. We're back in two. Writers from around the world are outraged over how their work has been used to train artificial intelligence without their knowledge or consent. And as Valerie Ouellette tells us in the CBC News investigation, that includes books by some of the biggest names in Canadian literature. Title Author Drew Hayden Taylor had no idea. Wow. My plays, some of my nonfiction, and my novels. That nine of his works were part of Books 3 a massive data set used by tech companies to train artificial intelligence. Well, I, it's a combination of being flattered and being concerned. Almost all of my income has been derived from um, royalties. It, it's literally taking the milk out of my, my cereal bowl. Um, 
is very, very, very worrying. A CBC analysis identified more than 1,200 Canadian authors and their 2,500 books. It's a who's who list of Canadian literature. Margaret Atwood, Alice Munro, Mordecai Richler, Michel Tremblay, Leonard Cohen. Nearly three quarters of all Giller Prize finalists and Canada Reads contenders. Like you can see almost yeah. all of Alice Munro's. Yeah. This technology and law professor says, even though these books are all protected by copyright law, it's not clear that their use for data training is illegal. One of the arguments that's being made is that the, the training um, that is being done is really just extracting data points and information from the work as text rather than really using the works as works. The Writers Union of Canada is considering a lawsuit. I mean, copyright can be very abstract and hard to understand, but I don't think that, that taking a, pirate, a pirated book from a pirate site and uh, using it for your own industrial purposes. I don't think that's hard to understand that that's wrong. At least five lawsuits mentioning Books 3 and several tech companies have been launched in the U.S. Meanwhile, in Canada, the federal government is having its second consultation on AI technology and copyright law in less than two years. Valérie Wallet, CBC News, Toronto. As the Israeli military pushes deeper into Gaza, civilians say they're just running out of options. We're talking about barren bits of land or street corners. The struggle to find safety in a war zone. And Israel's former prime minister weighs in on the war and Benjamin Netanyahu's leadership. In any normal country, he would have resigned October 8th. But first, all eyes are on the Toronto Blue Jays as baseball's biggest star picks a new home. I want you guys to look at the pie chart, the likelihood of the teams where he will go. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Adrienne Clarkson has achieved so much in her career. Earlier today, she received another honor in a ceremony right here in the National Studio. The longtime CBC News journalist, who later became Canada's Governor General, was inducted into the CBC News Hall of Fame. I owe a debt of gratitude to the CBC, to everything it's ever stood for, for all the people who've worked here and have cared for it, and all the ones who cared for me. And I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. She spent three decades here at the CBC, including time hosting Take 30 in the Fifth Estate before moving on to other huge roles in public service. She is revered for her courage and interview skills, her ability to ask the questions people at home were thinking about. And she's had the sort of impact that still makes a difference here. Another honor tonight for Taylor Swift. She is Time's Person of the Year, the first woman to ever receive the title twice. Swift's Eras Tour is projected to be the highest grossing of all time. A lot of Jays fans are likely holding their breath tonight. Baseball's biggest superstar could be coming to Toronto. Thomas Daigle now with the anticipation and the speculation. Nothing could get baseball fans amped up in December like rampant rumors about the hottest player on the planet making his way here. Maybe. Please come to Toronto. They'll be great. I think this is one of the perfect city for him. Japanese free agent phenom Shohei Otani is in serious talks to leave the Los Angeles Angels after six seasons. The reigning American League MVP at age 29 He's an ultra-rare ace pitcher and super slugger. He's doing both, and he is excelling at both. We have quite simply never seen that before. This past season, Otani hit more home runs than anyone else in the league. Now sports media are devoting hours of coverage to speculate about where Otani will land. I want you guys to look at the pie chart, the likelihood of the teams where he will go. The Blue Jays are considered one of his most likely picks, but the club's management is keeping quiet. Any deal to pull off that is of some significance is exceptionally complex. Otani went to the same high school in Japan as Jays pitcher Yusei Kikuchi. He's also said to have enjoyed his previous stops in Toronto, like this one last year. But there's more. 
Obviously, Otani would be playing here at the Rogers Center. In your mind, what might attract him to Toronto and to Canada? It doesn't quite have the same baseball media focus that like a New York or a Boston might have. Otani has always preferred to avoid distractions and maintain his privacy as much as possible. Recent surgery is likely to keep Otani from pitching next season. Still, he's looking for a major payday, and Jay's owner, Rogers, has deep pockets. Otani himself has said nothing publicly about any of this. Whenever he does sign a contract, it's expected to be the biggest ever in North American sports, worth more than $500 million U.S. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Right now, we are breaking down the Israel-Hamas war. How will the battle in Gaza shape the chances for future peace? Ehud Barak has some blunt things to say. I will speak with the former Israeli military and political leader in a moment. But first, the world watches Gaza's unfolding catastrophe. Israel's military campaign intensifies and the crisis for civilians worsens. The Hamas-run health ministry in Gaza says more than 16,000 are dead. And with so many of the living crammed into a tiny space, another warning from the UN, the risk of epidemic diseases. Israel says it is directing civilians away from its military targets. Ellen Morrow shows why aid agencies say there is no safe place to go. Palestinians displaced again and again at every phase of Israel's ground offensive into Gaza. We can't find any carts or transportation, says Ismail Obeid on the move with his family. People, feel for us, for God's sake. The UN says 1.9 million people have been displaced, nearly 80% of Gaza's population. And as Israeli troops now press further into the south, Gaza civilians are being pushed into even smaller areas. People are being moved around by chess, by chess pieces. It's, it's cold, it's callous. To be honest, it's calculating. Israel says it's for their safety. We will operate in maximum force against Hamas while minimizing harm to the civilian that Hamas places around them as shields. But Palestinians and aid agencies assert there's no safe place for civilians in Gaza. With a population of 2.2 million before the war, Gaza is a small strip of land, just 41 kilometers long, between 6 to 12 kilometers wide. Israel controls its coastline and most of its land borders along with Egypt. A week into the fighting, the Israeli military told 1.1 million people in northern Gaza to go south past this line into an area about 30 kilometers long. As it targeted Hamas in the north for the deadly October 7th attacks in Israel. I call on civilians to get out, says Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, move south. Hundreds of thousands eventually fled through evacuation corridors opened by Israeli troops, so many on foot, carrying what little they could. Countless ending up in crowded, squalid tent cities. Israel's military said the South would be safer. Still, it's been hit repeatedly throughout the war. Here, the aftermath of an Israeli strike in Han Yunis, the largest city in the South in mid-October. This was Nasser Hospital in Han Yunis around the same time. The rush to save children injured, hospital officials said, in another Israeli strike. Where do we go, says this man whose family moved from the north. Where exactly should we go? Can you still hear me? Yes, I still do. See you. We reached Akram al Satari, a journalist in Han Yunis. Communications are difficult. What has it been like for you? A chronic anxiety. It, uh, fear. Even when you are sleeping at night, you wake up to the very strong explosions. Israel's most important ally pressured it for change. Taking more effective steps to protect the lives of civilians, including by clearly and precisely designating areas out of the line of fire. It means avoiding further significant displacement of civilians. 
In this expanded ground offensive, now into Han Yunis, where Israel believes senior Hamas leaders are hiding, the U.S. says Israel's strategy has shifted somewhat, pointing to a new grid system created by the Israel Defense Forces for more targeted versus the earlier mass evacuation orders. Those in the central and northern Han Yunis blocks being told to move south. The fighting intensifying. The IDF talked about ramping up attacks in Han Yunus, and I can see your face when I tell you that. UNICEF spokesperson James Elder just left Gaza. What do you think the next few days look like? Utter bloodshed, just heartbreak. More and more children will see their mom and dad killed. More and more parents will spend the rest of their life um, not having their daughter or son who's been killed. Israel blames Hamas, accusing militants of shielding behind civilians. It's also proposed a safe zone here in Al Mawasi, just one kilometer wide, 14 kilometers long. But international organizations say that's nowhere near a serious plan when hundreds of thousands need shelter. We're talking about barren bits of land or street corners or or, or, or half-empty buildings. They can't get support there. They can't get clean water. Akram says his family has been told to go to Rafa, about 10 kilometers south, up against the Egyptian border. But if they leave, he fears they'll be forced out of Gaza entirely, never able to return. The situation is extremely dire, and it has been leaving very, very profound effect on the people, the ones who were lucky to stay alive. Staying alive for the displaced is getting harder by the day, say aid agencies. In these overrun camps, they now call home. We may see from disease the same number of children killed as we have from bombardments. So Ellen, I think beyond fear, we've also seen a reluctance on the part of some people to, to evacuate south in this war. That's right, we have seen that after calls from the Israeli military for civilians to evacuate ahead of expanding military operations. Many Palestinians, like Akram in the story, say they fear being pushed from their communities forever. They fear, they say, being pushed into Egypt's Sinai desert by the Israeli military. Uh, a senior member of the Israeli government, a far-right minister, has said it would be better if Palestinians weren't in Gaza. If they were in other countries instead. That's adding to those fears, especially because there's such little clarity on what could happen in Gaza after the war, and because there's this history of forced displacement for Palestinians hanging over all of this. All right, well, everyone is watching to see what happens. Ellen Morrow, thank you. You're welcome. A former Israeli prime minister is calling for Benjamin Netanyahu's resignation. The main responsible for this unprecedented blunder in our history is Netanyahu. What he says is needed to inch no, closer to towards peace. In any When it comes to Israel's recent history with Palestinians, Ehud Barak knows the politics and the war. The one-time IDF leader was defense minister during the war in 2008, and he was prime minister during formal peace talks more than 20 years ago. What are his thoughts now? I spoke with Ehud Barak about how the war is being fought, what comes after, and why he says Benjamin Netanyahu must resign. We're talking to you as, as Israel's most decorated soldier, talking about a war that is now uh, if not the longest, but approaching to be the longest in Israel's history. I have no idea where this goes. What do you think? It's clear that the two, two clocks are not synchronized. The military operation needs, so to speak, if you ask the general, needs many months from, from now, probably more. And the, uh, the, the pace by which we lose the legitimacy for this operation as a result of the operation itself is causing the loss of life of, of innocent citizens on the other side. is a ticking much faster. So we have to bridge on it. There is so much anger, as you alluded to, right, around the world as to the, the loss of civilian life in, in Gaza and the Americans in particular uh, 
seem to be um, asking for results, not just intent. We try to do our best in Gaza. It ended up, however you look at it, in more than, than the world can swallow of uh, collateral damage. Some governments, and even in America, there is certain uneasiness. I believe that we will do it uh, somewhat change it in style when you come to the southern part of Gaza. There is even uh, differences in the nature of urban landscape between Gaza, which is the uh, high uh, towers, and uh, Khan Yunus and Rafa, which is much lower and more uh, crowded, dense kind of uh, structures. I believe that we will try to learn some of the lessons and try to reduce the number of casualties in order to, to minimize the damage to civilians. I hope it will work. There's talk of the war, then there's the talk of after the war. The former defense minister and prime minister says fury at the leadership in Israel goes beyond the despair and rage that the October 7th attack happened, beyond the brutality of the war. There's frustration that there does not appear to be a plan for Gaza. His advice is something Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu doesn't want to hear. Work with the Palestinian Authority. In order to, to be able to hand it over, hand over the, the Gaza Strip to the uh, Arab multinational force, that needs a lot of trust. That needs, uh, they, they expect to know that when they do the, those steps, they are promoting a new chapter that might include uh, steps toward the two-state solution. So that solution is one that Netanyahu would just tear up like a piece of paper. If this won't work, we might find ourselves in a deadlock. We might find ourselves in a gambling on, on widening the, the war into a regional war, which I don't believe serve anyone, either, neither our enemies nor ourselves. What is your sense of, of what may be changing on the north, on the border with, with Lebanon and with Hezbollah? Look, you, I cannot predict, and I don't think that anyone else can predict. We do not have an interest in uh, deterring a full-scale war in the north. The Americans, they are deploying uh, military assets in the region in order to deter Iran Hezbollah. So I think that Iran and Hezbollah might be deterred. We cannot be sure. Are you worried about the Americans, about their patience? No, I, I'm not worried. But, uh, to tell you the truth, uh, Biden is uh, highly admired here. It's clear that the more time passes and more especially is worried about uh, civilian losses and about the uh, humanitarian needs. And we have to find the ways to do maximum in order to, uh, to provide it, not just because Biden wants it, because that's the right way to run uh, the war. I understand that the Israeli public, the, the polls are pretty clear that they want Netanyahu to go. But in terms of within his own party and within the government, how much pressure is there for him to go? The main responsible for this unprecedented blunder in our history is Netanyahu. And 70%, which, which include 40% 40, 40 of his own voters, uh, say that he has to resign. You know, I tell people in, in any normal country, he would have resigned on uh, October 8th. But Israel is not normal normal country in this regard. And, and that's why we are in this uh, internal split. If ever there was a time when peace felt close, it was when he was prime minister, jostling with Yasser Arafat at Camp David while Bill Clinton was president in 2000. A two-state solution was suggested, but a deal didn't come to be. His thought now? Don't consider that moment ancient history. Just maybe this is precisely the time to revive a similar deal. I will forever see that picture of you and Arafat trying to squeeze through the door at Camp David, Bill Clinton, all the laughter, the, that, that moment of um, getting close to a deal that wasn't signed, that that this two-state solution never came to be. It, is what you are proposing now similar to that? I mean, a lot of time has gone by, but how similar would yeah. they be? I'm a great believer in the uh, old Roman saying that if you don't know which port you want to reach, no wind will take you there. Leadership has to have vision, have to have 
uh, objective, never lose sight of where, where are you heading? Otherwise you don't know how to, to act uh, in the present. And I think that, uh, that the right vision for Israel in the, lo in the long run is two-state solution. It has been 20 years ago, it's now and will remain the same. Uh, other alternative is a dead end. So what we need now is to do a government, unity government, I believe without Netanyahu and without the, the racist messianic guys. And this uh, government has to run the war and go uh, into the next stages, probably less violent or lower profile than the, the present one and uh, into a new election where this uh, these issue uh, together with many other ones will be cl clarified and decided by the people. I cannot thank you enough for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's bring in senior international correspondent Margaret Evans, who's in Jerusalem. So Margaret, you heard Ehud Barak there talk about wanting to revive the idea of the two-state solution. What about Israelis and Palestinians? How is that landing there, and, and, and how has, has the war changed them? Yeah, it's interesting, Adrian. I, you know, when I think about it, I think about it a little bit as if uh, the two-state solution is an idea. It's almost like an old toy that's been left in the toy box. It's out of favor, or has been out of favor for a long time. And now, all of a sudden, the international community that used to accept and promote it has picked it up again. But the situation here on the ground is so dire, the distrust, you know, at unprecedented levels, that it makes it very, very hard for Palestinians and Israelis to actually pick it up again and believe it. You know, and you know how hard it was the first time, and that was 30 years ago. So I think it would be a very, very long road ahead to get people back on board with that, and it wouldn't, it would really need big, serious international commitment. Margaret, thinking of the international community, there is growing international pressure on Netanyahu. What's the impact of that? Yeah, Adrian, we heard again today from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, calling for an immediate ceasefire, warning that the humanitarian system is on the verge of collapse. Israel has a difficult relationship with the UN Secretary General and a number of UN agencies, but we're also hearing from groups like the Norwegian Refugee Council saying this is the worst, one of the worst assaults on a civilian population in our time. That kind of language, the images we're seeing out there, but so far the Israelis seem determined they are in the south of Gaza. They say they are in the heart of Han Yunus, and they seem determined to carry on this operation until they can ensure that Hamas can't hurt them again. All right, senior international correspondent Margaret Evans in Jerusalem. Thank you. Coming up, a stereotypical rescue with a bit of a shocking twist. Oh, oh my God! Oh, oh, oh my! Oh, here, check out my cat. The death-defying leap next in our moment. Yeah, so this is not where you expect to see your house cat 10 meters up with nothing but air between it and the ground. Quite an unnerving sight, but do not worry. He, his name is Coco, is just fine. So Coco, the orange tabby, had been chased up the utility pole by a dog, and he chose to just spring into the air just seconds before being rescued. Coco's terrific leap is our moment. Oh, my God! Oh, oh my... Oh, here, check out my cat! He's a sweet cat. He, like, you know, he gets up in your arms and lies down. He's a friendly cat. I know, my boy. There was a dog running around the garden and chasing the cat, and that's how we got up the pole, the dog oh, chasing He's going to help you, my love. Coco! Then one of the neighbors said, maybe an eagle will come along and grab him. I said, oh, no. And my husband and the neighbor tried to get a ladder up to him, but we couldn't get the ladder up far enough. Watch he don't scratch you. And, and that pole was really high. Oh, my God! Ah! The only one you can call is light and power. So then one of the guys started to climb up. My heart was pounding. Oh, here, check out my cat! And he wasn't very far. And the cat, I guess, with the pole was shaking and he was afraid. He just leaped. But as he, when he hit, hit the ground, he took off running. So I knew, like, you know, that he was good. He came in the house after and lied down and he was perfect. You wouldn't even say it happened. Well, cat got nine lives, I guess. 
Oh, Coco, you know he's going to do it again. A big thanks uh, from her, from everyone, to the Newfoundland Light and Power people who made that climb. Apparently, cats can climb up, but they have a hard time climbing down because of the way their claws are shaped or something like that. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.